This Week in Pediatric Oncology, the podcast exploring hot topics and exciting advances in childhood cancer. TWIPO is produced by Solving Kids Cancer, nonprofits located in New York and London dedicated to improving research and supporting families because every kid deserves to grow up. Subscribe to TWIPO through your favorite podcast platform. This Week in Pediatric Oncology, the podcast about new advances in childhood cancer. Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode 89, recorded on July 30th, 2021. I am your co-host, Brenda Weigel from the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I am here along with my co-host, Dr. Tim Kripe from Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio, affiliated with The Ohio State University. We are joined today by Dr. Andres Hexey from the Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's Hospital. Dr. Hexey is currently an assistant professor in pediatric hematology oncology. He originally hails from Budapest, Hungary, where he did his undergraduate and medical school education. He then went on to a residency in infectious diseases before moving to the United States and starting a residency in pediatrics at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles in 2006. From the graduation of his residency, he uh, traveled to Texas Children's Hospital where he has remained uh, and uh, did a pediatric hematology oncology fellowship and also a chief fellowship year. During this time, he trained in the lab of Dr. Malcolm Brenner and learned extensive uh, skills in cellular and immunotherapy for uh, childhood cancers. It is this work that he has continued to advance as an independent investigator um, at Texas Children's and Baylor College of Medicine. We are excited today to learn of Dr. Hexey's work in utilizing engineered cells Uh, particularly T cells and natural killer T cells for the treatment of childhood solid tumors, most recently uh, published uh, in uh, Nature Medicine last year. uh, And we look forward to hearing more about this. So welcome, Dr. Hexey. As a first uh, question for you, um, we know that immunotherapy and cellular therapy have really taken off in the last few years. And a lot of work has been done, particularly um, in looking at T-cell therapy in leukemias. And you have expanded this into using cells called natural killer T-cells. And can you explain for our audience the differences between a T-cell and a natural killer T-cell and why there may be advantages to using one or the other in particular childhood cancers. All right, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And one, one thing that I would wanna mention is that uh, the, my, my postdoc work was in uh, uh, Dr. Leon in Metalita's lab. And although I did interact with, a lot with Malcolm, but um, the work focused on natural killer T cells was under the direction of, uh, uh, of Leon in Leonid Metalita. And, and with him, we, we started, uh, you know, um, studying these cells with the notion of, of trying to engineer them to better target certain uh, solid tumors. And the, the reason why NK T cells for short, so natural killer T cells could be a, an interesting cellular platform to treat um, cancer is that these cells uh, have the natural ability to traffic to penetrate certain solid tumors. And it's well described how they are sensing certain molecules to get to those tumors. What, what's interesting is that when they are there, they, they do not target directly the cancer cells. So for example, neuroblastoma cells are not recognized by them. But what's interesting is that um, when NKT cells are present in, in neuroblastoma tumors, those children actually have better outcomes. Which, which you know, obviously uh, brought up the question, well, how, how is that possible? And it turns out that you know, tumors are not just cancer cells. There are all sorts of other cells in there, including other white blood cells, um, myeloid cells, so macrophages, for example. And these macrophages create an environment that enables the cancer to grow, blood vessels to, to uh, come in, supply nutrients. 
So these macrophages that are called tumor associated macrophages are the target for NKT cells. And there's a specific CD1D molecule dependent um, pathway by which NKT cells recognize, for example, in neuroblastoma, tumor associated macrophages and eliminate them. And uh, that was kind of the premise of, of the work. We wanted to take it a, a step further that to engineer NKT cells so that they don't only recognize these TAMs, these macrophages, but also directly target the cancer cells themselves. So that's a, gr a great beginning explanation. I have a question about that though. If NKT cells are targeted macrophages normally, how come there are macrophages there? <laughs> what, what, what's the dynamic? Is there some right. checkpoints or inhibitors or just not enough NKTs? Right. So it's one thing that they recognize the CD1D molecule on macrophages, but that CD1D molecule has to present on a ligand, um, another little uh, piece for the NKTs to be activated and, and go after these macrophages. And it's not clearly understood what those molecules are. The, well, the most studied molecule is called alpha galactosylceramide, And it seems that you know, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the cancerous environment, those molecules appear and presented through the CD1D molecule on the tumor associated macrophages. So they become target, they can be recognized by NKT cells and they can be modulated or, or eliminated by them. Are there differences, Dr. Hexi, you mentioned neuroblastoma, are there differences with sort of that macrophage infiltration in that what I think would classically be called the tumor microenvironment that is different between say neuroblastoma and other solid tumors that occur in pediatrics? Is there something that, as you said, that seemed to be associated with that better outcome in children that had high levels of natural killer T cells in neuroblastoma. Are there, do you notice differences um, between different tumor types? I, you know, I, I'm not, not, not qualified to really comment on all the other pediatric solid tumors, but it does seem to me that, uh, you know, the tumor microenvironment is highly varied based on, depending on the tumor we, we are looking at. And, and each of them has its own kind of major players, maybe myelodisp-myelod-derived um, um, uh, suppressor cells or tumor-associated macrophages, cancer-associated fibroblasts, other stromal cells that not just help the, the tumor to grow, but also produce all sorts of inhibitory factors that dampen the immune response um, um, against the cancer cells. So in, in, in neuroblastoma, at least, there are certain pathways uh, described in which you know, certain chemokines are produced by the tumor cells and by macrophages that bring in um, other cells, including NKT cells, which can then modulate in, under normal circumstances the, the tumor to some degree. It's not enough, though, so that's where engineering comes into into play. Your approach was to target them to the tumor cells by putting a chimeric antigen receptor against GD2 on them. Did you, so that they would actually kill the tumor cells as opposed to just, will they still kill the macrophages in the tumor mm -hmm. microenvironment? Do they retain that ability? Yeah, so that was one of the thing, one of the questions we wanted to answer is, okay, well, we engineer these cells, now they are, now they are recognizing neuroblastoma. That was Re relatively straightforward, but do, do they retain their ability to recognize macrophages? And the answer was yes. So we did test uh, this phenomenon in the laboratory by expanding uh, monocytes and differentiating them toward what resembles tumor-associated macrophages uh, in the Petri dish, basically. And then when we co-culture them with NKT cells, the NKT cells did recognize and specifically uh, target them. And, and do you need to, um, I, I think you need to expand them, right, ex vivo, because yeah. there's not very many that you can isolate, but right. do you need to uh, engineer them for each patient or can they be used uh, autologous, uh, um, or, uh, allogenically. Autogenic, yeah, right. allogenically, yes. 
So our current study in children with neuroblastoma is in the autologous setting, meaning that each patient has a leukapheresis, so a, 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 a white blood cell collection. And, and then we specifically generate a product for the child. It takes about 10 days, um, but unfortunately, you know, the testing after that takes a couple extra weeks. So it takes about four to six weeks until the patient can actually get the cells infused. And we are working on an off the shelf and kind of allogenic approach when, when uh, you know, master cell bank is created with these CAR NKT cells. And then if a child presents with a tumor, then, uh, or, or an adult per se, then they can be treated right away without a, a delay, which is obviously um, not, not the best thing if, uh, if someone has a recur recurrent cancer that we say that, okay, well, for six weeks, we can't really do much about it. And during those six weeks, if you have a patient who you have taken these cells and you're engineering them for that patient, what happens to the patient during those six weeks? Right. Yeah, so we encourage them to receive uh, some sort of bridge therapy. We are completely on board with the family and the treating physicians that you can't just sit around for, you know, several weeks and, you know, watch the tumor. So we do encourage, you know, some salvage regimen to be put in place. And, and if, you know, there's a great surprise and the child responds extremely well to that regimen, then the cells will be there frozen and can be used, you know, several months or even years later um, in case the child would go into complete remission. So we, we are trying to work with the families to make sure that, uh, you know, that they, they still receive the best care. Are there any circumstances where a patient, you wouldn't get enough cells from mm -hmm. them, even when you expand the cells? Are there some limitations to sort yeah. of the doing this tailored for the patient that that would limit your ability to to proceed. Yeah, so we want to make sure that they, the patients have recovered from previous chemotherapy. I mean, kids um, in, in our studies case for, for who are treated with neuroblastoma go through a, a significant amount of chemo. And then when they recur, they get more. So they, their cell counts in the blood can be somewhat low. So we wanna make sure that that reaches a certain level that enables us to, to manufacture with, with high certainty. So we monitor, we monitor their total white blood cell count and their absolute lymphocyte count before coming in for collection. And we wanna make sure that that's at a reasonable level. Are there other restrictions on eligibility, age restrictions, and uh, what did the FDA sort of make you do or ask you to do in order to open this trial up? Um, so the, the eligibility is you know, pretty much open for all children with high risk neuroblastoma that has recurred or, or, um, or has been resistant for, for therapy. We wanna make sure that these children would tolerate lymphodepletion and then cells. Um, so they have to have a certain uh, organ function cutoff met. Um, and, and they have to have a certain life expectancy. We can't take, you know, unfortunately it's, it's, it's sometimes it's a sad situation that, you know, patients who are at the very end of their journey are coming um, for help. And, and, you know, sometimes it's just too late. So um, those are the key aspects. One thing is that uh, we started to look at is uh, whether there is, there is any evidence of human anti-mouse antibody present in the child. You know, with the use of the GD2 specific monoclonal antibody now widespread, there is a potential for, um, for the induction of these human anti mouse uh, responses. So we want to exclude that a child who, is, who has that because the receptor, the outside of the receptor, is derived from a murine antibody. So that could potentially trigger an allergic and anaphylactic reaction, which, which, was, which would be uh, obviously concerning. In your study that you're conducting, um, what are the key things that you're looking for to say that this engineered NKT cell product is successful? What, what, is, what are the key things you're looking for to say 
we did what we want to do and now we can move forward to the next step what what are those key things so first and foremost you know it's a phase one study looking at these engineered nkts that are at high purity now for the first time in humans so we want to make sure that the approach is safe and thus far it's been really reassuring that we haven't seen any dose limiting toxicities and most of the side effects were related to the lymphodepletion. But of course, we want to make sure that these tumor, these CAR NKT cells expand, persist, and go to the tumor sites. So we are monitoring them in the peripheral blood and we also look at post infusion biopsies and try to track them and understand their behavior there too. So those are key um, outcome measures as well. And although it's a dose escalating trial and it's in a phase one setting, we want to know if they work, right? So at the end of the day, um, many things are safe to do, but we want to have a product eventually as we continue to dose escalate that does eliminate or at least significantly reduce the tumor burden. And how much progress have you made? I know you reported three patients in last uh, November, October timeframe. It was seen to be safe at that point. And uh, do you know, uh, like how many more patients have you enrolled? How many are you looking to enroll? How, how long do these cells last? What kind of things are you measuring? Yeah. So we've enrolled, we've, uh, we've treated 11 patients already. So we are now on dose level four. And uh, we have already manufactured another product um, and have an, you know, additional uh, products uh, to be manufactured in the upcoming weeks. Going to the other part of your question, um, we are ma- monitoring the, the NKT cell expansion and persistence very closely for the first four weeks post-infusion. That's kind of the day 28 cutoff is the uh, most focused part of the study when we are looking at safety expansion persistence. After that, we are still asking for samples from the patients to see if, even if they go off study or off treatment, whether the cells are persisting longer term as well. And thus far we've seen, we've been able to detect NKT cells in, in all of the patients, and, but there's a pretty big variability of uh, expansion potential in, children, in, in, in the patients who get it. So we are trying to understand what is what is determining whose cells are expanding better and whose don't? There seem to be a correlation between disease burden and the ability to expand and then to have a response. But you know, we only have a handful of patients, so it's hard to make really, you know, overreaching conclusions just yet. On that note, um, Dr. Hexi, if you if the these the cellular product is very well tolerated and you, you know, there's not a lot of toxicity. What do you think the key measures are going to be to say this is the dose or this is the uh, product um, to move forward for a larger study or a, the next the next step? How, how are you going to determine that? Right. So we have to look at, we are looking at two things. One is what is available out there for children with relapse refractory disease. And that's, you know, there's high dose MIBG therapy, for example, there is um, other chemotherapy salvage regimens. And of course the antibody, GD2 specific antibody with some chemotherapy and and GM-CSF combination has been shown efficacy as well. Uh, None of them are perfect. None of them are, you know, 100% complete remission rate. In fact, you know, the the response rates are, are much lower Uh, and the toxicities for all of these therapies are not negligible. So thus far, our toxicities have been really, really favorable. Um, So as we dose escalate, we wanna reach, you know, a good, you know, 30, 50% response rate and maintain, um, you know, the safety profile, in which case, you know, this approach would be much more competitive than uh, their existing approaches. I I think, you know, one can, one can obviously look at what would be the optimal response rate and what would be the optimal complete remission rate. I think that's just something that we'll, we'll see when we get there, how, how things are turning out. But that's what we wanna look at. So what is available, how safe, how, what is the toxicity profile that's what's available and compared to that, what, how our product compares with 
with, uh, with when looking at also the efficacy of, you know, outcomes. And do you have plans to combine any other therapies with this therapy once you sort of reach the, mm -hmm. the dose regimen that you want? And are there particular kinds of therapies that you think will synergize best with yeah. these cells? Yeah, so right now we don't have anything uh, planned. We've been just trying to make the cells as effective um, as possible. I think there is, a, there, is, there is a role potentially for combination therapies, but it would be nicer if we can just engineer the cells that nothing else is needed, but they are already designed and made in a way that they can take care of the tumor without additional help. Um, that's, you know, we, we, we got approval for two additional dose levels, so dose level six. So that's to be seen but whether, you know, we, we'll get to that uh, uh, goal. Is there a reason that you think that um, these cells will work better than CAR-T? You know, CAR-Ts have had a, hmm. a real problem in solid tumors, I think, because the microenvironment is so right. resistant. Uh, are, do these cells um, evade some of those immunosuppressive yeah. factors better, or why do you think they might work better? Well, one aspect is that they, you know, they traffic to the tumor site in a chemokine-dependent manner, and that's pretty well described. Whereas with CAR T cells, you know, it's a bulk population and not all the cells will express the, the chemokine receptors that need good, good tumor cell penetration. The other aspect is, the, is targeting the macrophages. So if that indirect effect of, of, um, of uh, tumor control can help in addition to targeting neuroblastoma through the chemokine receptor, uh, the chimeric antigen receptor, that is a potential advantage. And you alluded to uh, you know, a potential application in, in the off-the-shelf setting. A big advantage of NK T cells is that they express an invariant T cell receptor. So um, if someone would receive NKTs from someone else, there is no risk of GVHD, graft versus host disease induced by the NKT cells. Rejection of the NKT cells is still present. So that's where a lot of I think science is going on, try to protect them from being rejected in the, in the patients. Dr. Hexie, you just brought me perfectly to sort of my next question, which is kind of the, you, you've brought on the table a few times sort of the off the shelf uh, approach and that that would get rid of the sort of six week window and yeah. would be sort of that next step. What are you doing sort of very specifically in parallel to to move towards that as what seems to me like an obvious goal and what are potential barriers, especially in the pediatric oncology space to moving to that off the shelf approach? Well, I think um, maybe I'll start addressing the, uh, the last comment, the, the barriers in the pediatric oncology where I actually don't think that there is anything specific to children that that would be a major barrier. I think it's more on the science, scientific side is to, to be able to evade the immune system of the host, the patient, after these off-the-shelf cells come in. We rely on the immune system to reject anything that's foreign, maybe a virus, a bacteria, a parasite, and so on. And, and so now we are trying to do, trying to overcome this, um, function of the, of the immune system by, by engineering our, our NKT cells not to be recognized by it. And it's quite tricky. So there are certain ways to do it. And we are, we are working on these immune rejection evasion strategies and, and try to optimize them for, for um, the off-the-shelf uh, approaches. So we're starting to bump up against our time limit, but um, I kind of wanted to wrap up then with more of a bigger picture question in terms of the future of this technology, where do you see, um, do you have a pathway to like get it approved to patients? What, what, do, you, what do you think the necessary steps are? And then uh, do you have sort of a plan to get that done? Do you think a big pharmaceutical company has to come in and what, what, do, what do you see in the future? Right, I mean, I think, you know, with thus far we've seen uh, with CAR and KTs, uh, some exciting, um, signals for anti-tumor activity and at the, in the context of safety. But we want to improve upon all this. And, and we are you know, basically just halfway through those escalation, a little bit more than halfway. 
Um, so you want to find what is the what is the dose for them, and 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 if the if safety is maintained and efficacy is is uh, encouraging, then I think you know commercialization of the of the product would be the next step. And there is interest from 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 pharmaceutical company that would be uh, would be definitely interested in doing this for children. So I think I think there is a clear path. The big question is, can we enroll patients on the study and learn and, 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 and get, gather the data in the next year or so, let's say, um, to, to say yay or nay uh, for further development? That's great. I mean, it seems like a very exciting platform. Thank These you. cells seem to have unique attributes and you, your preliminary data look very encouraging. So congratulations on all this work. And um, we would definitely wish you the best of luck in the future in making this happen and make it a reality for kids. Brenda, any last questions or comments? No, just congratulations. It is incredibly exciting work. It's uh, it's really the wave of the future and, and really exciting to see you move this forward. And thank you for sharing it with us. Well, thank you very much for your kind words and also for the opportunity to to talk with you and and uh, and share share our work with the larger you know community. Well, and thanks to the team at Solving Kids Cancer, a nonprofit charity dedicated to improving survival through creating novel treatment options for children. Remember, the more we learn, communicate, share ideas, and work together, the faster we'll reach the day when all childhood cancer is preventable or curable. As always, keep up the fight, and thanks for listening to This Week in Pediatric Oncology. We welcome your comments, questions, or thoughts on topics for future episodes. Just drop us a note at twipo at solvingkidscancer.org. You can follow Dr. Kripe on Twitter at KidsOncDoc. Send an email to Dr. Weigel at weige007 at umn.edu. And find all Twipo episodes at solvingkidscancer.org.